yeah, I don't like that narrative at all. But what up, everyone? Shaquille Mahjoudi here for CBS Sports, and you know who this is. He is the UFC's number five ranked middleweight contender, fighting Robert Whitaker at UFC 290 on Saturday. He lands strikes about as often as I struck out with the ladies in high school, both setting records. Drikas Duplessis, how's it going, my man? My man, so good to be here. Feeling great. Good to be back in Vegas, and uh, thanks for having me. Of course, International Fight Week. No better time to sort of have that big moment leading to a title shot, of course. You versus Robert, a title eliminator to face Izzy later this year. Before we get there... I did read that you recently had nose surgery, and as someone who has a really hard time breathing, I'm wondering, what's the best and worst thing you've smelled since getting your nose surgery? Well, I have to be honest, as I often tell people that, uh, you know, with my nose surgery, if I was sleeping, I could, there was quite a bit, like, it affected me. My smell wasn't that affected, to be honest. My smell smell was, was fine, and if I was breathing in a sense of, just normal soft breathing then it was actually not that bad but as soon as i start breathing a little bit harder that's where the problems came in so you know just you know sleeping which ultimately makes you a mouth breather and that's a terrible habit to have for you know anybody can tell you that for life in general for sports and uh you know for recovery like when you're fighting you're breathing through your mouth but when you're recovering or when you're you want to breathe through your nose and that's where where things uh went a little bit south for me but um you know in terms of smells i'm i've always been good with smell so i'm I'm really happy because i think it would have been weird if i didn't have my smelling on point for that long yeah well when i finally started taking some like nasal sprays i reached the conclusion that most things smell awful concerts people have gross bo um, <laughs> <laughs> the horse stable next to my house not great but you know at least i can taste the sushi a little bit better so you gotta take that sounds that. great um so in terms of your uh training and your fight preparation you know the the gas tank is i think it's a little overblown we'll get to that later but i know it's something some fans have been critical of for you have you noticed a significant Im- improvement in your cardio and your stamina since getting the nose surgery yeah, I wouldn't blame that on the nose surgery at all. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't blame myself getting as tired as I did on the nose either. Uh, I blame myself looking tired on the nose for sure. Um, you know, I blame myself the way that I was breathing so heavily because obviously breathing through a mouth looks intense, and with an open mouth breathing very shallow breaths, that looks like and that does make you tired. You know, that's going to make you hyperventilate. Like, but I've never wanted. I've, that's. The only thing I've ever blamed the nose on, it was actually mm. looking as tired as I did. But, uh, you know, I've, I, I'm feeling amazing. We obviously, we try to go in there better and try the pace that I fight at. I try to, we go and we look at the way I want to fight, which is the way I always fight, full speed. Let's go from the word get-go and find ways to make sure that, because obviously I did get tired, but getting to a place where I can fight that style and keep it up and not get tired to a point where I'm compromised in the fight. So I wouldn't blame that on nose surgery or uh, the nose, the problem. I wouldn't say now that I had surgery, that problem, that's that that's going to be gone. That's not it. Why, why it will be gone is because I work my ass off and I'm fitter than ever. My gas tank looks better than ever. My cardio is better than ever. And we went and we just... We added so many things to make sure that we are ready. We we did all the tests that we possibly could. We did, like I said, when we started this camp, no stone was left unturned. Every single thing I possibly could do, we did. And I did it with all the conviction in the world to make sure I go out there. And I don't care what people think. I don't care if people say I look tired as long as I get my hand raised. And that's what I've been doing. And that's what I, what I intend on, on doing is going out there and fighting an absolutely brilliant fighter in Robert Whitaker, a guy that seems to never get tired and beat him at his own game. Well, that's why I kind of said I felt it's a little overblown because, sure, maybe by the end of that second, third round, the cardio is starting to weather a bit, but you're putting out quite literally historic middleweight striking numbers, landing versus absorbing percentages, and you're still getting these finishes late into the fight. 
when you say you left no stone unturned, um, are the approaches to sort of improving and kind of further dialing in that cardio, are they more in the actual physical preparation or is it more in the game planning of how you sort of manage it over the course of a fight? Yeah, well, that's that's a very good question. I think um, you have to take both of those in consideration. You know, there's only so much you can do. Like when it comes to working hard, like people say work on your cardio. And I'm like, guys, like everybody saying work on your cardio does not know what the hell they are talking about when they are talking to me. I am a workhorse. I am the hardest worker in the room every single time, or at least I go out to try and be. I go out there and I compete with every single person in that gym and myself of yesterday, every single time I step in there. So it's not a matter of, of, of working hard. I know that's not the problem. And um, it's about being, uh, getting the right people around you with the right knowledge and making sure that the right energy systems fire at the right time, making sure the right muscles fire, making sure the right, like I said, energy systems are firing at the right time so that I train in a way that complements my fight style because my fight style if you go look at my first ever fight to the last one is when the ref says fight i fight i'm not in there to save energy i'm not in there to to look for a gap i'm there to make a gap i'm there to create an opportunity to finish and i'm not there to wait for an opportunity to finish and i go out there like you say i, I understand that i look tired because i am because i go out there and i have an output i go out there to fight i go out there and at the end of the day, there's two men in that ring. And when I go out there with the kind of output that I do, my opponent has to match that at the end of the day. And uh, if I'm used to it and he's not, uh, the results will be like it has been in the, in, in the, you know, in the past few years. You know, uh, you were quite complimentary of Robert Whitaker as a fighter. He's been very complimentary of you. And, you know, he said that he feels like your opponents tend to underestimate you and not give you due credit. And, it, you know, he's taking this challenge very seriously. When you examine the fight very quickly, what do you think is the biggest advantage Rob has in the fight? Vice versa, where do you present the most problems for him? Yeah, I think uh, that's why Robert Whitaker is who he is and where he is. That's why he's been at the top of the pile for so, so long. And, that's why he's a fan favorite. He deserves to be. You know, uh, I can't come into this fight expecting to be a fan favorite if you're going up against the warrior and legend of Robert Whitaker. Now, I have to still earn that, and I will earn that spot. And Whitaker is a guy that is a martial artist, a true martial artist. He's a, he's a warrior, and he's never bought into his own hype, and that's why he's such an incredible athlete. He is a guy that, you know... Show me one fight where Robert Whitaker came into the ring unprepared, where he looked like he didn't have a great camp, where he, even if he had an injury, where he looked unfit, where he didn't look strong, where he didn't look in shape. No, that's not the way he operates. He's going to be a guy that every single time you fight him, you know you're going to fight a guy that prepared for this fight like it's the last fight that he'll ever fight. And uh, that's, that's why I have so much respect for Whitaker, not because of what he's achieved, but purely because of the consistency over all these years, knowing and seeing the improvements and seeing how hard he works. He's, a, he's an inspiration to so many people and you know, young guns looking up to these fighters. That is what, that's what it takes to be at the top of the park. And he is somebody that I looked up to coming up in the sport. And uh, I like to use the term of killing your heroes in flight. And he is somebody that is, I pride myself on my work ethic and what I go through to be prepared when I step into that cage. So, you know, Whitaker does have the, the experience advantage 100%. Five rounders, he's had so many. I think people mistake, make the mistake of thinking that I don't have that experience. I fought only title fights for six years. I only had title fights. Five rounders, it wasn't the UFC, but I had three titles in two different weight divisions uh, across the world. So I know what it's like to prepare for a five rounder. I know what it's like to fight under uh, uh, as a main event. I fought shows, massive shows in Wembley and KSW, massive, massive crowds. So I have that experience. He has obviously faced the top level of competition in the world many times. And that's, his, that's, that's the only, I would say, advantage that he has is the fact that he has faced the best of the best, but he hasn't faced me. So at the end of the day, that's, that's a whole different ballgame. And where my advantage lies is exactly that. The fact that he hasn't faced me. The fact that the style that I bring might seem odd, might seem weird, but nobody knows how to stop it yet. And 
you know, I keep on developing the style. Every time I step in there, I want to be better and I try to be better and we work on being better. And there's only one way to find out what I really can do because there's a mystery to it. And the only way to find out is by getting in that cage with me. And uh, I think that's, that's going to be my weapon, going in there. And my power is misleading. My speed is misleading. And my overall skill set, I think, is misleading. And like I said, I, I came into this fight. I want to prove a point on my cardio. And, uh, you know, Robert Whittaker is a guy who's never gassed out in a fight. And we'll see. Um, this is a title eliminator. The winner will be facing Israel Adesanya for the middleweight title. Um, at least from my perspective, unfortunately, this whole sort of narrative of African champion has sort of bled into this fight. And you have since, in an interview with Submission Radio, clarified you're not saying that you are more African than Israel Adesanya or Francis Ngannou or Kamaru Usman, simply that you are a resident of South Africa and you want to bring that world title home to Africa. I am curious, though, do you sort of see how that quote that got out of the African fighter could be taken as insulting or invalidating the fighters that come from that African diaspora? And is it something that you wish maybe wouldn't have taken over the narrative of this potential fight between you two as much as it seems to have? No, I don't understand why. Why I don't understand why uh, it would they would feel it takes away from them at all. Because the fact of the matter is that I do live in Africa. It's it's simple. I do. I simply stated a fact. So um, you know, I think they maybe had. I don't think they listened to the original interview. To be honest, I think they went and listened to some comments. They maybe I did, they started to some. I will breaks. say this in your defense. I did see a lot of quotes of real African attributed to you and. Maybe I'm wrong, but I couldn't find the word you saying the words real African. I haven't said the word once. That's what I said. I said, please show me where I said said fake. They are fake Africans or where I said that I am the real African. I didn't say that. I simply said I am the fighter that resides, the African fighter that still resides in Africa. That's what I said. So, I mean, I don't see why anybody would be um, offended by that. It makes no sense because that's the fact of the matter. So, uh, I mean, you know, if they want to be offended, I don't care. Uh, it, it, I, I stated the fact. And right now, that whole narrative doesn't mean anything to me. What means anything to me right now is fighting Robert Whitaker, And we'll deal with everything that comes after that, after I've beaten Whitaker. Do you think, uh, last thing on this one, do you think this is something that might become a reoccurring theme in the buildup to you versus Izzy fight? Is that something you even want to be sort of? Amplify because yeah. it's not the sort of fight promotion that I love, and I don't think by your sounds it's not something you necessarily meant to sort of take this tone that it has. No, not at all. I think uh, well, the fact that uh, Israel Adesanya brought race into into the conversation that anybody brings race into a conversation like this that was disgusting. I thought that was terrible. I thought that was uh, taking a step backwards. I was I was honestly shocked. I couldn't I couldn't believe it when I saw. It. I couldn't believe when I heard that race was poured into it. It was, I, to be honest with you, I, I felt like the world of sports just took a step backwards. And that was ridiculous to make it about that. And that's why that's, I, was, I was really disappointed. And, you know, Adesanya, as a champion, has some sort of responsibility, I think. And, you know, for him saying that, it doesn't offend me at all. I'm not offended at all that uh, at any racial slurs that he called me. I don't. I don't. It doesn't offend me. But the fact that that's that example that he's setting as a as a champion, that's a little bit. You know, I think I don't think that belongs to to a champion's character. I don't believe that's the message you want to send. So I mean that in in that case, that narrative. I don't want to be a part of that. You know, that is like I said, it's disgusting and it's stupid. It makes no sense. So, um, yeah, I don't like that narrative at all. But at the end of the day, I am the guy that's going to take the belt home to Africa, where I live. Okay, well, thank you for fielding those questions, Rikas. I do appreciate it. Uh, as we wrap up on this interview, I do always like to sort of take a step away from the fight stuff. You get asked about it all day. Talk a little bit about you away from the fight game, if that's okay. Perfect. Let's go. All right. First, for, first and foremost, what MMA sport do you beat Cameron at the most and vice versa? Where does Cam have your number? 
Well, we did a putting challenge the other day and he absolutely destroyed me in that. And we did some archery. Like, you know, when it comes to motorsports, I just beat him. Like anything with speed, I got his number. You know, motorcycles, uh, go-karting, all that stuff. I'm, I'm beating him. So we actually do a show together where we do a lot of these activities. But uh, when it came to shooting, like archery, he just, he was really, really surprisingly good at it. Like he beat a professional guy in archery. And you know, golf is really good at it. my man's aim is on point. He is accurate, and uh, so I mean, we like to compete with each other on on everything. So I would say, in when it came to the shooting game, Cameron had my number. As, and also, I have to say this: we were at this at the Schmo's place, and we did a putting challenge, and he absolutely obliterated me. But uh, when it comes to the adrenaline stuff, when it comes to the speed, I'm 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 still one up. Okay, speaking of adrenaline, uh, have you jumped off the world's highest bridge bungee jump at Blue Carnes Bridge in South Africa? And if not, what would it take to get you there? Oh, yeah, I've, I've already done that. That's amazing. Yeah, no, I loved it. It was awesome. Yeah. I'd honestly rather go skydiving than bungee jumping. So well, I actually did both in the, on this, in the same week. And uh, the bungee was 10 times more uh, scary okay. than the than the. Than the you don't zero style. out, right? You're just, it's just a free fall. <laughs> Yeah, and obviously, like, you see the ground coming close. When you're skydiving at 10,000 feet, you don't see the ground. You just see some clouds. So if you're, if you're jumping off that bridge, you're seeing the ground coming close. I so said, that is super scary. Okay, I'll, I'll leave the adrenaline seeking to you. Uh, last one. What, in your opinion, is the best South African dish? Are we going biltongs? It's something with pap. Ooh. I have a really weird spot for Panerati's pizza. Panerati's pizza, but they have a, a vinaigrette salad dressing that you just put on a pizza that's amazing but uh when i'm going with south african dishes a proper bride boltong boerewoord steak pop there we go that is the and the bride broikies bride broikies okay. that is the way to go what's the best like cut of biltong like what animal well uh definitely uh beef going beef is by far the best then i would say steak a proper rump steak and uh boerewoord Perfect, always. It's the best. Well, in the States, they would say sausage, but they have never tasted anything like it. If you've tasted that, you will never eat sausage again. And then, of course, some great pop and bribery to carb up and make sure that it's a proper, proper 3,000 calorie meal. <laughs> well, maybe after the uh, weight cut, we can treat you some on the way home. Damn can... straight. <laughs> yes, sir. You've been so great through the time. I want to leave you with the last word, so I'll do my part very quickly. Guys, thanks so much for watching the video. If you're still here, please subscribe, tap the bell, thumbs up. Let us know what is your official prediction for Drikas Duplessis versus Robert Whitaker. That's on the main card of UFC 290 International Fight Week. We'd love to hear from you guys. Shout out to CBS Sports, as always, for empowering the video. Drikas, if there's anything you want to let the people know, the floor is yours, my man. Well, I mean, everything that needs to be known will be known on the on the 8th of July. I'm 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 really grateful for all the amazing support the people have been have been very accommodating. Uh, you know, me coming here to the states, fighting um, uh, in front of a of a foreign crowd. It's it's absolutely been a, an amazing journey, and you know, I'm here to to put on a show, and it's going to keep on getting better. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for tuning in. Thank you for every single fan. You know, the people back home in South Africa. We are the best. We have the best fans in the world. We are getting behind myself and Cameron like you won't believe. Uh, we feel that love. We feel that support. And thank you, everybody. Thank you for, for, for making uh, this dream a reality and you know, making this so awesome. And the number one, the spot is coming. And soon we will bring that belt home.